Hi guys, welcome to the Studentship YouTube channel. I am Stanley. Today in our biology series, we'll be discussing respiration. Is why you are here, like this video and subscribe to this channel. Respiration is one of the features of living organism. This implies that both plants and animals, they respire as long as they live. Respiration in a layman's definition is the process of breathing in oxygen and bring it out carbon dioxide. This process is crucial because while carbon dioxide is being breathed out, plants use this carbon dioxide to photosynthesize their food products in the ecosystem. But the encompassing definition of respiration says that respiration is the process of oxidizing food products in the cell with the release of energy, carbon dioxide, and water. So what happens with respiration is that the food molecules that we ingest get oxidized and once they are being oxidized they give us energy carbon dioxide and water this means that respiration is the major way in which we take in oxygen to oxidize food and also the major way in which we breathe out carbon dioxide for plants to use for their photosynthesis so what happens to respiration is food gets oxidized to give us energy plus co2 plus water the real reaction is our food is glucose plus what will oxidize it is the, is the oxygen that we take in plus oxygen which will give us energy the energy that we we'll get from respiration comes in the form of atp and atp stands for adenosine triphosphate this is a nucleotide that is the energy currency of the cell it supplies the energy for the body consumption so our energy is in the form of atp then bring down our co2 plus water respiration in a nutshell we oxidize the food that we take to give us energy carbon dioxide and water so if i should expand this more it means for the major food source that we're taking is glucose glucose plus what oxidizes this glucose is the oxygen so glucose plus oxygen will give us atp which is the form of energy in the body then co2 plus water if i should bring this down again i'm going to have the real equation of respiration which stands which says that So this is the real equation of respiration. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 will give us 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus ATP. So this is the real equation of respiration because this stands for glucose, this stands for oxygen, this stands for carbon dioxide, this stands for water, and this stands for ATP, which is the energy. Respiration can be of two types. We have the external respiration and we have the internal or cellular respiration. The external respiration is the respiration that occurs between the cell and its exterior while the internal respiration or the cellular respiration is the one that occurs inside the cell today we'll be discussing basically on the external respiration check the link in this video to see the part two of this tutorial we discuss about the internal respiration which is the part two of our tutorial these living organisms they have different respiratory structures or different respiratory organs these organs carries out the function of respiration. For example, when you come to the mammals and reptiles, they respire by an organ called the lungs. If you come to the fi to fishes, they respire and some tadpoles too. They respire by an organ called the gills. If you come to the insect, they respire by an organ called the tracheal system. Spiders, they respire by long books. Earthworm. And some amphibians like toads they respire by means of skins this is where we see the external external respiration in total so these are some of the organs that this that this um living organisms use to respire also in plants they respire by stomata and lengthy cells so these are the different system and organs in which these living organisms use to do carry out the external respiration so we take it there one by one but before that let's discuss the features or the characteristics of a respiratory membrane because these respiratory structures they have membranes in which they used to respire and these membranes they have some some features which is of significance so let's talk about the features of these respiratory membranes so the number one feature of these respiratory membranes is that number one they must be moist moist means that they, they have to be kind of wet this moist environment helps the oxygen that we take in to dissolve in them for easy diffusion so the respiratory membranes must be moist for this oxygen to come inside number two 
they must have a thin membrane. These organs must have a thin membrane. This thin membrane helps the diffusion to be fast. For example, if this is a membrane and oxygen wants to pass across to this side, this is an ideal respiratory membrane because it provides a thin membrane for oxygen to diffuse here. This thin membrane for the ideal respiratory membrane must be one cell thick. This membrane helps the oxygen to diffuse from this part of from this part from, from this part to this part fast. It's, it decreases the, the distance for, for the diffusion. But if you come to this um, example below, this has a thicker or it has a, a, a bigger membrane and it's going to it's going to prolong the, the diffusion time for oxygen to move from here to here. So an ideal respiratory membrane must have a must be thin. Also, another feature of respiratory membrane is that it must have a large surface area. This large surface area provides the oxygen a big avenue for a for a bigger number of gases to diffuse into the cell. So a large surface area is one of the features of respiratory membranes. Then lastly, highly vascularized. The respiratory membrane must be highly vascularized. What do I mean here? What I mean here is that they must have a reach of blood vessels. Blood vessels must pass across these membranes so that there can be an exchange of gases between the blood and these respiratory membranes. So these are the features of respiratory membranes. Right. So in respiration, what happens actually is that these gases, they move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So oxygen in air will move into the body or cell because here it have a high concentration of oxygen. It moves into, into, into the cell because here it has a low oxygen concentration. Okay, this was, this, this was inspiration. Then carbon dioxide dioxide TO2 there is a high concentration of carbon dioxide inside the, inside the cell or the body so this CO2 tends to now move out to the exterior or environment so this is what actually happens in respiration so basically you ask yourself why do living organisms why do they respire number one is that it's creates an avenue in which we get rid of this young man called co2 co2 is a metabolite it's a waste product and it ought to leave the body because it doesn't leave the body the body acid base balance will be altered so that's the number one function the number two function is that it gives us atp atp which i told you is the energy currency of the cell so this atp helps the body to carry out a lot of function a lot of function so the importance of this respiration in respect of ATP they include they help in signal transduction in nerves so this ATP helps the nervous system to transfer signals along the nerve fiber also this ATP it helps respiration the energy got from this respiration helps in growth of cells also the energy got from respiration helps in active transport in the body this can be transport of ions or transport of nutrients so the energy we, we got from respiration we can use it for active transport in the body so we can use it to transport ions across cells also we can use it to transport nutrients in the body also the energy from respiration can be used for muscle contraction for your muscle to contract you are moving your hands you are, you are moving you are blading you are you are walking about if, 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 if there's no respiration in your body you won't get this energy to move about for your muscle to contract also, we use this energy for the repair of body cells, that's in protein synthesis. So, respiration is very, very important in the body because it, it helps us to carry out those functions. So, let's discuss re this external respiration in some specific organisms. So, firstly, let's talk about the external respiration in some unicellular organisms. So, here, what happens is that they use their body surface to respire. Example, amoeba, paramecium. What happens here is that oxygen from the exterior in high concentration diffuses into so the, the cell interior of these cells that's amoeba and paramecium. So for the fishes, like I told you before, what the fishes use to respire is what I call the gills. So these gills, they are specialized respiratory organs in the fishes, which are four in the each in the in each side of the head of the of the head of the fish. So it means that here you have four of them, also here you have four of them. And these gills they are covered by, by an organ called the opac opaculum, and each gill have a roll of gill filaments. So these are the gill filaments. Then inside you have what we call rica. So this is sort of a gill. So you have the gill filament, you have the gill arc, and you have the gill rica. So a particular gill has a double row of gill filament this way. This is the first row, this is the second row. So basically this arc anchors this gill filament. Why these rica? They don't have a, a function for respiration, but, but what they basically do is they help in, in protection and also to direct food to the mouth of the fishes. So what happens is that, like I told you, these gills, they line the lateral side of the head of the fish, four on this side and four on 
the side. And they're covered by this um, sort of called operculum. Right. So when the fishes want to respire, their mouths, their mouths are closed initially. So when their mouths are closed, they are, the floor of the mouth is lower. Is lower. So basically, the, the fishes, they open their mouth. When they open their mouth, water rushes inside. So when water rushes inside, they tend to close their mouth. So this is the source of the, of the gills. So you have the gill recounts inside. You have the gill filaments here. Like I told you, you have, it is, it, they are in a double row this way. Rule of the gill filament. So what anchors them is the gill arc. The gill arc. And they are covered by the operculum. So like I told you before, these gills, they are found on the sides of the head of the fish. Four on this side and four on this side. And they are covered by sort of called what? Peculum. When the fishes open their mouth, water rushes inside. So why this water rushes inside? The floor of the mouth is lower because the mouth is open. So once they open their mouth, the water is going to rush inside to sit at the at the floor of the mouth. When they open their mouth, right? Nice. So once, once they now close their mouth, the floor of this particular mouth is, is going to be raised up. So once they raise up, those water, they tend to leave to, towards the sides of the head of the fish. And they tend to leave through this operculum. So once this water is, is leaving, there will be a gaseous exchange between the water and this gill filament. Because this gill filament, they are highly vascularized. There is a high mass of meeting blood vessels in this gill filament. So once, the water is, so once water is leaving through these gills, this water tends to exchange oxygen with the gill filament. And also CO2 leaves through this gill, gill filament, the water which, which, which now leaves through the operculum. Like I told you before, the insects, what they used to respire is what we call the trachea system. So expansion of the thorax and the abdomen of this insect tends to draw in oxygen into what we call spiracles. So this spiracles is going to transfer this, this air towards the trachea, which now ends in tracheolus, which now supplies to the cells. So this is the way in which inhaled air reaches the cells of this insect. From the spiracles to the trachea, from the trachea to the tracheolus, from the tracheolus to the cell. Nice. So let's talk about respiration in earthworms. So like I told you, you, the earthworms they respire through their skin. So the skin of earthworms, you know, the skin of earthworms is, is formed by a cuticle material which is produced by the epidermal cells. Also, these epidermal cells they produce mucus which lines the skin of these earthworms. And this mucus tends to make the skin of this earthworm to be moist. Like I told you one of the features of this rotating membrane is that they must be moist. So this moist skin of the earthworms helps to trap in oxygen. Also, so once oxygen traps in their skin, this oxygen diffuses into the body of the earthworm. So this oxygen Oxygen in the body of the earthworm, they will now combine with the hemoglobin to form the oxyhemoglobin. The oxyhemoglobin, which now moves towards the system of the earthworm to supply oxygen to the viral cells of this earthworm. Let's talk about the toad and frogs. This organism they respire by the skin, they respire by the mouth, also called the buccal respiration, and also the lastly they respire by the lungs. So they have three major roadway of respiration. That's why they can they can survive on land. They can survive also in water nice. so in mammals in mammals mammals which me and you belong to we have a more complex respiratory structure in mammals and some reptiles too okay we have a more complex structure okay so our this diagram is going to help or help me to illustrate what i mean here so this is our trachea system our trachea which ends in two bronchi this bronchi will now form bronchiolus so this bronchiolus is being found in the substance of the lungs so mind you that this bronchiolus they end in what we call the air sacs the terminal alveoli So then this is being covered by a membrane called the pleural membrane. So this is the um the lung system in mammals and in reptiles. Nice. So this is our pleura, this is our trachea, this is so this is our bronchi. So this is our bronchiolus. So this is our alveoli. Nice. So it's ready to know that this lung system they acquire the thoracic cavity the, and so they also have some sort of the lie with they have the gullet which is behind the trachea they also have the heart which is on the left side of the thorax before, before we reach the trachea up here you have what we call the pharynx and the larynx so the pharynx is the junction in which both the nose and the mouth and the in which both the nose and the buccal cavity tends to meet so the pharynx is like a meeting point for, for both the nose and for the mouth so after the pharynx you now meet the epiglottis the epiglottis, it helps to direct food towards the gullet. So this epiglottis covers the glottis, which is the upper part of the trachea. Okay, the upper, upper, upper part of the trachea is the what? The glottis. So you can meet the vocal cord, which is the larynx. So this glottis is being covered by the epiglottis to prevent food materials from entering into the trachea 
Because once put my enter into the trachea, it's going to elicit some irritations. Nice. So from this trachea down, the oxygen enters here, and here it branches into, into these two bronchi, which now ends in this bronchioles. So the major gas exchange is now occurs here in the alveoli, in the S sac. Here is where the major oxygen exchange occurs. That has oxygen entering into the cell here and CO2 entering here to be expired. Nice. So the mechanism of respiration in mammals, basically in man, is of two major is of two major ways. You have the inspiration and you have the expiration. So we are going to discuss what happens in both inspiration and in expiration. Basically, there's a structure that divides the, the thorax from the abdomen, and that structure is called the diaphragm. So if you are talking about the difference between inspiration and expiration, you must talk about the movement of the diaphragm. So in a normal person that's not inspirating, the diaphragm is doom shaped. This is the side view of the thorax. So this is our diaphragm, it's doom shape. So you know, in inspiration, you are trying to, to take in air, to take in oxygen. So what happens to the diaphragm is that the diaphragm is going to flatten. Because once it's flattened, the volume of this uh, uh, the volume of this thorax is going to increase. I'll give you an illustration. So let's say this is the doom shape of the diaphragm here that my hand is. So for inspiration to occur, the diaphragm has to be flattened. Because once it's flattened, the volume of this thorax is going to increase. And once the volume increases, more oxygen is going to rush inside the thorax. So in inspiration, the diaphragm is what? It's flattened. But in expiration, you are going to revert it back to the normal way it was before. So in expiration, the diaphragm is doom-shaped. Nice. Also, in expiration, the thoracic cavity is going to move upward and forward. <sighs> As you can see, so in inspiration, the thoracic cavity is going to move what upward and forward, which is the reverse in expiration, which moves downward in expiration. Also, in expiration, what we call the intercostal muscles, this muscles helps you to either inspire or to respire. But in inspiration, these intercostal muscles they contract the external intercostal, they contract. Why in expiration, this external intercostal they relax. So these are the very salient points that occur in both inspiration and expiration. So that's a wrap, guys. I'll, I'll be talking about the second phase of expiration, which is the cellular or the entire respiration. So we are going to see the link in this video. Make sure you click on the link to see the, how this respiration occurs in the cells of living organisms. So before we go, I'm going to tackle up some past questions, some live past questions to test what we have learned for the day. Okay, okay guys, so these are some some past questions we're going to talk about in external, external respiration. Okay, guys, this is some some live past questions, past questions that we're going to discuss um based on our external respiration that we just discussed about. So this question says the correct pathway for the movement of air during respiration in insects is dash. So A we have furaco to trachea to tracheolus to body tissues. That's A. Then B we have trachea to spiraco to tracheolus to body tissues. Then C we have S sac to spiraco to trachea to body tissues. Then D, we have spiracles to S sac to trachea to body tissues. So our answer is A. A from spiracle to trachea to tracheals, then to the body cells and body tissues. Okay, the diagram I gave you below here. Our next question is gaseous exchange in the bony fish is carried out through the dash. A, we have nostrils. B, we have lateral lines. C, we have gills and you will have skin so the answer is gills 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 is the correct answer so lastly the question says that which of the following statements is true of inhalation of air by man a we have the ribs are not raised b we have diaphragm is raised c we have intercostal muscle relaxes and e we have size of thoracic cavity increases so the answer is e the size of the thoracic cavity increases so that's a wrap guys so if you have any question of any, any of any type let me know in the comment section and i'll get back to you as soon as possible also, don't forget to like this video and also to su subscribe to our channel for now bye bye